All right, let's get real. Not everybody has a thousand or so dollars to spend on an extremely expensive blue cat bed. But what if, without locker block welding skills, you could make a machine that was capable of taking you off-road for a budget of, say, around 300 to $400, depending on whether you'd like to have a winch on the front or not. In this case, we're going to be working on just such a build. We've got this LT-1000. It has an MST in the rear, which is the key to being able to do this build due to the method we'll be using to limited slip this transmission. Now, with a couple of key components, you can take this beat-to-snot machine and make it into something fun. Now granted, you don't need all of these components. I'm throwing on a new carburetor just because it's cheap insurance to do. But the real Achilles heel that we were after first was this intake on these brakes. So the air intake on these actually comes up through or out through this side vent here, which means that if you hit the water with this, the only option it has is to suck water right directly into the engine. So if you drill four holes, one, two, three, four, then during the time you have that water impact, that splash, that whatever, it has an alternate place to get air from that it'll take. This is how you fabricate a really quick independent choke. So right now we got no choke. We pull this and we push this over and we've got choke to start. We pull it back, pop it in the hole and we're running. So this is what your choke wire usually looks like. And then that way, when this lever comes up, it pushes the choke closed in order to start it. And then it ends up coming back and sitting there while you run through your RPM band. So if you make it independent, then on the back side here, if you want just a little bit more RPM capability on your throttle, this spring on the back side is what controls your governor pull. So if you tighten this spring up or you put a zip tie through it, it becomes a direct connection to your governor in order to get just a little bit more RPM out of it for when you upgrade to having a gas pedal later. Work smarter, not harder. Three quarter inch bolt welded onto a car jack, impact, and six two by fours, three on one side, three on the other side. You get in underneath, you undo your shift linkage, you undo your brake so that it can drop out. You brake free all of the nuts and bolts. There should be one on this side, one on that side, two there and two there. Lower the whole thing down, take them all out, lift the whole chassis up, slide your transmission out. All right, let's see if we can figure out these transaxles. Actually, let's grab some light first. We'll turn these on. So this is my lie power, which is actually solar powered. And it controls all the lights in the shop, fully off grid at this point. So we're gonna crack this open and we're going to be swapping axles out because one of these axles, I believe this one, is bent. This MST here is a Murray axled MST. So these axles actually stick out further in order to be able to widen the rear of the machine just a little bit. As you can see, this one here, somebody didn't take my advice. So on the back of the machine, there is a plate on the back of it. 
And people get lazy trying to do these pulleys and they take off the back plate that's right here in order to be able to see in to do the pulley easier. And then they leave the plate off, the whole thing flexes, and when it torques up, you blow the bottom of the transmission to smithereens. The other thing is, those little front brackets you need to weld triangles into in order to reinforce them. They suck, they're horrible, or you can just plain put a piece of plate from here across, welding it in so it makes one triangular piece. Whatever works for you. But reinforce those. They're always broken right there if you off-road them. Now, what's up with the weird springs? Can you see the difference? Maybe if I come down next to them? There we go. So this one, as you can see, I can move it. This one, as you can see, I can't. In the description below will be a link for buying these as an upgrade kit for a motor. This is out of a single cylinder Intec. I think it came out of like a 14 or 15 horsepower. But they all use the same basic 16 pound spring all the way up through to even into the 20s and 21s. Inside the differential of this is one of these springs which is why earlier we were able to do halfway decent on the off-road area with turf savers way better than we normally would have. There we go. So there's our upgrade spring. There is the spring that's been in there while we've been testing it. It seemed to work out pretty good. Now the other thing I'll point out is that these are progressive springs, which means obviously the shorter it gets, the harder it is to push. And I probably could have shimmed it out with some washers and maybe tack the washers in. But a set of two of these was only like 10 bucks. So we're there we go. Bigger, better spring is in there. That now is pretty darn tight. It'll still turn if you really torque on it. But that's significantly tighter than it was with the stock uh, Briggs & Stratton Intec spring. So now we're going to throw the whole thing back together and go from there. Just a side piece of advice. The first time that I was monkeying around with this and trying to get it to go and go in, I did it using a regular basic vise. I set the spring in, crimped it enough so that the pin would come out on each side, and then dropped my bowl gear down over the top. So there we go. At this point, we'll throw it all back together. This transmission has like three different strip bolts in it and some through bolts and it's all just rigged, but we're gonna go play. Let's give some advice nobody's going to listen to. First of all, before there's any chance of removing this, immediately weld this seam on both sides. That way, when you remove this in order to mount a winch or to be able to mount other things, this piece doesn't just get ripped off the front of it. I see people mount a winch here and remove the heat shield bolts, and this just folds up on them one right after another. Now, on a do as I say, not as I do, underneath here, right here where this is, Cut yourself a triangle piece, weld it right in here, but not before welding this seam all the way up through. On this piece right here, if you take a piece and weld down this seam, weld down this seam, and then put a piece of half inch angle iron from here to here, it'll make a giant difference on how this reacts. If you want, you can cut this flat and put a piece of angle iron over the top. On the other side, on the other side, we've got the shifter to work around. So as you can see, there's a shifting bracket there. So you just want to reinforce this with weld in order to be able to brace this as much as possible. On this side also, you want a triangulated piece right in here. 
and you want to weld this entire seam. Now, I'm not going to do that, not out of the fact that I'm not taking my own advice, but because I eventually intend to flip the transmission in this, bring it up into the chassis for another experimental build. But that's what I would do if you're at this stage. Now, transmission RTV sealant is dry at this point. We're going to go grab the transmission and put it into this thing. Oh, so we got a rear seat brace off of a Husqvarna of some sort. I don't exactly remember what model number it came off of. I think it was one of the ones with the Cowies in it. So we've got this. We got our battery box in here. We need to wire the wires into the battery box. We haven't gotten there yet. And we got our zip tape patched up seat. Good to go. Passing on a bit of veteran mud mower knowledge. Anytime you have one of these pins and you can put it in a way that a stick cannot catch it and pull it out while you're out on the trail is a good idea. Normally these are installed going this direction in your brakes. As much as it makes it harder to take out later, put it in from the top. I have seen these get removed by sticks, and these ones that are underneath here, you want to make sure you insert it from the front going back, because if it gets hit by a stick, the worst thing that happens is it ends up getting knocked in further. But if the loop is over here and it catches a stick, it pulls it out and you lose your tie rod right out the top the next time you flex. If you're going along at 20 miles per hour and that comes out, not a good day. The problem I'm running into right now is that these are older style like Murray rims and those are short axles. See how tiny they are? So the inside here is actually too long on these rims. So what I do in order to make this work is I take a cutoff and I cut across like that. And then I take a grinder disc like this and I grind it down till all of those cut marks are gone. And then test and fit onto there. Once it's on correctly, you'll have room for one washer and a clip. This. This is what I'm too tired and I screwed up looks like. I forgot to put the axle keys in after all that work. This is one of those mods you don't think about until after you fry and cook a few winches on the front of your machine. So what I've done is I have cut this because stock, it shoots it right underneath where it is that you would have a winch mounted, right in this area. Whether it's up here, whether it's in front, whether it's whatever. So by cutting it there, I can snap this off, which is still extremely hot. And now it'll shoot out the side at this angle while still maintaining the integrity of the muffler. Just a helpful tip in order to save you a few hundred bucks worth of roasted winches because I learned that one the hard way. I'm going to be swapping out this front. I'm just going to unbolt this and drop it out and I'm going to put in this one that is cast iron. If I was leaving this in, then what I would do is I would cut this off flat right here. And then I would take a piece of angle iron and I would lay it on here and I would weld it. Or welding this seam entirely solid. On the outside of here, I would lay something on here and weld it totally solid but not without removing these spindles and taking out the plastic little bushings that are in these. And then on the underside of this, I would lay something on here, or I would seam weld it. These have a positive thing. 
they bend. They don't break. So if you hit something really, really, really hard, then these tend to bend back, and you can still, most of the time, drive back out of the woods or the mud hole or whatever. If you are running a cast iron front end, you can hit tons of things with them before they will break. But that is the key thing about cast iron like this, is that if you hit something hard enough, this is gone. Nada. Does not exist. Broken off the machine. And driving this out will be hell. So, not strong. Bends. Most likely you can drive out. Extremely strong. But if you do screw up, you're going to have hell to pay to get it out of the woods. I'm swapping to this. Do as you like. Before I cut the tabs off and swap this front end in, I want to show you the Achilles heel of Craftsman Steering. This bar right here, if it has these bends like this, these are just really light, mild steel. What you do is get a piece of angle iron and run it all the way down through and weld it on so that the angle iron sits just barely above this. And then that way this doesn't bend up in because when this bends, it ends up going into your engine pulley and it will cause sparks and light things on fire. So this is no joke. If you're going out on the trail, make sure that gets upgraded. The other upgrade is to put 3 8 heim joints on either end of a better grade piece of pipe. As it is, this one has an older style one that's on it that I'm going to run for now. And eventually I will replace this with heim joint. So when you're checking these, what you want to do is go up and down with them. So that one is fine. This one is fine. Let me show you the one on my girlfriend's. And this would be the definition of not fine. On a side note, you can cut a washer and put it on here and weld it so that that way you can get a little bit more life out of this. But really at this point, you should be starting to upgrade to Heim joints. This is doable by yourself if you just lower the rig down onto it, but it's so much easier with two people. By the way, I'm sure there's a different way that you would do this. Good. Get out in your garage with your child and start building. Yep, yeah, so undo that. So click, yep, there you go. Now do it upside down. There you go. Now put it in. You gotta hold it upside down. There you go. Now fix the other one. See, John's been doing this with me for his entire life. And even he forgets the tips and tricks. So there's one for you guys. Another important thing here is to add a piece of angle iron right here. Cut down. And that acts as your bump stop. So that you can't end up getting jerked around. Because if you don't hit, have that bump stop and you catch a rock while it's like this or a stump or a tree, it'll pull that around and it'll bend and mess up all the rods and everything. You're better off to hit on that bump stop than you are to go and have the pressure go down through this tie rod. So now we need to go around and do the same thing to the other side. Personally, I'm not a fan of the fat lip look. But, 
A lot of people do it because then they don't have to cut up and modify their hood. And when you're dealing with these Craftsmen with the plastic front ends, that's a big bonus. So what I've done is I've modified the hood so that it takes less of an angle to drop the hood in, set this as high as I possibly can, and now I'm going to weld this MTD bush bar in place along with welding up the backside of this winch. Now, always plan ahead on your mounting bolts for your winch in case you have to replace it in the future. This thing is janky. This thing is junk. I will be putting a champion winch on here in the future. So I got to make sure I blow some holes in back to be able to go and put it on. Now, if we lift this and we pull up, we can remove it. The reason being, and I'll try and do it on video, is right there on that little tab, I cut it. So now, it takes less angle to get it to drop in and stay in place. Probably one of the uglier setups that I have ever done, but it clears. Over here, we've got that run down through in behind, behind the gas tank to the controller hanging right here made sure to cover it so it doesn't chafe from there down through the actual positive cable runs through a grommet right there that is gigantic so down through zip tied to the positive up through under here and in a bow tie and it works now to monkey with that there are multiple videos on this all over the internet. The next time you see this thing, it'll probably be driving around the yard. Because what you will hear is you will hear the the spring grab and you hear it go in the rear end and then you drop the rear tire by shifting your weight and she goes bang oh because it goes to posi <laughs> because it goes to posi when it hits on that spring so when you when you get off you have to get it back down with your hip or something real quick because the tire that is off will go. Well, Bang! The good news is you're never going to get stuck. You know? it limited slip helps. Ladies, what he's saying is he's good with his hips. Well, that means he's good. <laughs>